Hello and welcome back to our discussion today on the Woodwind Choir. This again is based on uh, your bladder textbook. Some of you are taking arranging, composition, or instrumentation with me. So this is our ongoing uh, exploration of the different choirs. And of course, at the top of the staff, uh, we have the Woodwind Choir. Um, so pop quiz, whether or not you know this already, it's time to take your first quiz. So go ahead and take out a, a piece of paper. You can see how you, how you do. What does this sound like? A stream of air directed to the edge of an embouchure hole, splitting the stream, making a vibration. Give yourself a couple seconds. What does it sound like? That's right, the flutes. It is the only instrument to do this in the woodwind choir, um, directing air towards the edge of an embouchure hole. Okay, so far so good. What does this sound like? A pair of curved reeds made from cane set in vibration with a nasal buzz. Give yourself a few seconds. And what is it? That's right, it's the double reeds. You might have said oboe, you might have said bassoon, you might have said contrabassoon or English horn. And of course you would be right about all of those. All of those um, are under the same family of double reeds. Okay, and what is this? A single flat reed made of cane attached to a mouthpiece with a ligature vibrates with a squawk. Oh, not very polite. It vibrates with a squawk. All right, what do you think? And of course, we're talking about the single reeds. You might have written down clarinet or saxophone, and you would be right about uh, both of those. Um, if you've ever been to a convention, perhaps you've been to the flute convention, or you've been to the double reed convention, or the single reed convention, each of those is made up of, of those various family of instruments. Okay. I hope you did well on your on your first quiz of the day. If not, that's all right. We'll fill in the gaps as we go along. So some basic terminology that uh, we'll need to know um, in our exploration that we'll be referring to as we go along. Uh, conical bore, what is it? Well, if you remember back in your days of perhaps you took a chemistry class or some kind of science class, perhaps you, you would recognize the different sizes and different shapes of beakers. Well, a conical bore, of course, would be those that flare out at the bottom. A cylindrical bore, of course, is, is the same uh, as it is at the top, as it is on the bottom. Okay, so which instruments are canonical, which are cylindrical? Canonical would be those with a, a bell that flares out. So all the single and double reeds, as you can see pictured here, they all flare out towards the bottom, making a canonical shape. Uh, can you can you think of uh, the only instrument that's left with a cylindrical shape? That's right. Okay, here I have my my miniature keyboard, which will be representing uh, the flute. I wish I had a, a a flute player over my shoulder, but this is uh, the best I can do, uh, all by my lonesome here. Okay, so and you can see, of course, um, that affects the the timbre of the the sound. Uh, that this is the one can, uh, canonical, um, I'm sorry, conical, I keep on saying canonical, conical uh, instrument. What is the embouchure? Well, this, this refers to the position of the lips, tongue, and teeth in playing a wind instrument. The position of the lips, tongue, and teeth in playing a wind instrument. Of course, I won't make you memorize the various muscles that are used, the uh, the triangularis uh, in, uh, incisivus, I can't even see it or pronounce it. Um, that's not as important, but um, now and then you, you will hear, um, you will hear uh, our friends in the, the woodwind uh, choir talking about the various embouchures and how they're different from one another. So, and now you know what that means. Okay, here's a continuation of your quiz. For this, you might want to take, let's say, 30 seconds to pause this video. Um, so what is the head joint, the reed, mouthpiece, ligature, barrel, register, key? You can probably tell um, just by looking at these pictures, 
and uh, mixing and matching uh, by process of elimination. So let's let's put 30 seconds on the clock. Go ahead and pause this video and see how you do uh, matching these terms to these pictures. Okay, here's your moment of truth. Number one, what do you think? Is it head joint? No, that can't be. Read, okay, here we go. Exactly right, Those, that is the read. And of course that's a double read. Uh, friends of mine who, who play bassoon spend a lot of time shaving those down uh, and getting them just right. They spend a lot of time uh, with their razors and their cane. Um, that's, a, that's a big part of being a, a double reed player. Okay, uh, number two, hmm, looks like the top part of a flute to me. Ah, the, the top part, ah, the head joint. Okay, so that's what, that's what that is. Okay, good. Number three, actually, it has the the um, the answer in it. If you just read the uh, the overlay there, it says register whole cup. Ah, okay. So this is register key depressed. This is the register key. Okay, meaning it flips up an octave. Okay, and uh, number four, um, hmm, looks like some part of the clarinet. Is it the head joint? No. Read no. Mouthpiece no. Uh, it certainly is shaped like a barrel. Could that be a barrel? Yes. That is the barrel of uh, the clarinet. Um, number five, you could see these attached to clarinets or saxophones. Of course, it's the part that holds the reed um, to the mouthpiece. And you'd be talking about the, that's right, ligature, the ligature. And lastly, number six, I, I just said this word, it's the mouthpiece. So that is the, the top part of the mouth, mouthpiece. Um, the other side would be uh, holding the, um, the single reed. Okay, how did you do? All right, pretty good for, for just starting out in this class. Uh, I think you're doing, doing well so far. Uh, maybe you mix and match something, but now you know. All right. So, um, most sounds that we hear, most musical sounds can be can be represented by this sound envelope, as you can see on, on your uh, screen here. This is a representation of the sound wave. We have a first part of the sound, which we'll call the attack, ta. We have the continuation of the sound, which we call the steady state. This is where the air is continuing through the instrument. And of course, we have the release. We can't breathe forever. And of course, at some point, the, the tone stops, the air runs out, or we choose to, to stop it. Um, and so we have the three parts of our basic, basic sound. In fact, when I'm writing for, um, let's say, a, a flute, and I want a long sound, I might, I might be doing some singing uh, along with my composing just to get a sense of, okay, how long do I want this to, this to last? And I'm often thinking ta as my entrance. Some basic articulations. Of course, woodwinds are, are famous for being uh, very versatile and basically being able to perform um, anything you throw, throw at them within reason. And there are some exceptions and things to watch out for that are specific to various instruments, which we'll go over. But the, the basics are all there that you know already. So how do you represent uh, legato? We'll go ahead and draw, take, take a moment if you'd like to pause the video. Can you draw three notes and represent them as legato? Draw three notes and represent them as being played legato. Ah, okay. So just like you've you've been taught for uh, however many years that you've been studying music, of course, the, that's represented with the slur. And you wouldn't be wrong to say, well, is it also possible to just write the word legato above um, the staff? Of course, you can do that too, but um, it's better, and I'm always a fan of being more explicit, where do you want the, the legato phrase to start? And where do you want it to end? This is very important for a wind player, we, it not only shows where, for example, you might want to take a breath, but it also shows where you want to say ta. 
Non legato. Take take a few seconds. Let's say ten seconds. Can you draw out a few notes? Let's say four notes in a row, and can you mark them non legato? How would you mark them non legato? Oh, you don't mark them at all. In fact, you can just you can leave out the the words non legato, and just write the. just write the notes on the page. So if if nothing was written, this is basically where we start um, in terms of all of our training without slurs, without staccatos. Um, and think of each one of these as, as starting with ta. Ta 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 Not the world's best melody, but nice and simple. There's a ta or attack for the start of each. And of course, um, there's no separation, but there's no legato either. All right, and staccato, take a few moments. Can you draw out a few, a few notes on the page and mark them as staccato? How would you represent that? And of course, as we've been taught, We have our dots below or beneath the uh, below or above uh, the note head, depending on the the uh, direction of the stem. Um, could you just mark above uh, in italics staccato? Yes, in fact, that might make a lot of a, a lot of sense. Let's say if you had a whole passage of let's say eight bars, sixteen bars, all staccato. Well, you might save some ink and. Um, you know, it's, if it's very consistent, why not? You could just say staccato sempre. Um, again, I'm, I'm always um, a proponent of more detail and being as explicit as you can be to, for the performer to perform successfully what you imagine for them. So um, I'm, I would suggest, well, why not? Keep the dots. Okay, legato shadings, those in between, legato, non legato, staccato. Um, tenuto marks under a slur. Hmm. This would be quite low for flute, of course. That, that would be better, let's say, on a clarinet. Um, hmm. Tenuto markings under a slur. It's not to say that you should not use these. It's just to say that there is not universal agreement. Um, you could call this legato tonguing. Ti, ta, ta, ta. So we have a separate ta for each one of those, and it would be interpreted that that would be under a short uh, phrase. Uh, but as, as to how they're performed, well, you might find discrepancies between performers. So just know that if you do use um, this notation, know that it comes with a, a, a bit of, um, um, it's not as clear as you, you could make it. It might be clearer if you, if you simply marked, uh, let's say a single slur and then, um, three tenuto marks. Okay. Something to think on. What about dots under a slur? Well, again, this has the same, same problem. It's, it's a bit ambiguous, but this is quite common, really. Um, this says to the performer that these four notes are within a single phrase, but you want them played staccato. Um, I think you should use this when it's not clear exactly. Let's say you want a phrase where the first three notes or the last three notes are together and you have a separation. So if, if it's something that's out of the ordinary, then I'd say, okay, write, write the slur mark, meaning that's where the phrase starts and ends. If it's obvious, then I think you're causing a bit of confusion. What about tenuto and dots under a slur? So you can see here at the, the bottom um, of the, the downbeat of the second full measure, we have um, this this tenuto and staccato under a slur. Again, it's it's rather confusing.
Okay, a lot of markings here. I probably would have done without these slurs. At least that first slur, I'm not sure it's it's really needed. This makes a lot of sense. That, that makes sense to keep the slur. Again, so the tenuto there really is saying um, bring out or emphasize the downbeat. Again, there's a, there's there might be discrepancies between different performers. Um, just know that those markings are not universal. Um, and not only that, aren't we taught from day one that the downbeat is stronger? So again, I I'm more um, I, I would suggest that unless something isn't obvious already, that perhaps um, you could. For, for instance, let's say you wanted to bring out the second note in the, in the second bar. Well, that would make more sense to to write that um, as an exception. Uh, but we're we're trained already to to show where the weight is on the downbeat, of course. Okay. So again, the, these are legato shadings, things in between that um, could be cause for confusion. Non legato sh shadings. Well, we're throwing some shade here at our non-legato shadings. Okay, that was my uh, my effort to to update my lingo a little bit. How did I do? Okay, you can let me know later. So tenuto and dots shadings of non-legato stress and separation. Of course, this again has the same problem. You know, we know how to perform this staccato. We know how to perform this legato. What about non-legato? The little separation but staccato with with tenuto something in between and again um feel free to use this i like to use this in relationship to let's say a whole passage that's staccato and i want to bring out this one note well that makes sense to give it some weight or emphasis um, or perhaps you want it just a bit longer that makes sense to me uh, but I, I would caution you against using this too often. Staccato shadings. Um, so if you look at the, the page here uh, and find all the instances of the wedge, the wedge, which looks a, a bit like a, a skinny triangle, you could say. Um, perhaps you've seen these in, uh, depending on the, the instrument you play or or if you're a vocalist, you probably have not seen this 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 uh, marking before. So a a woodwind player would take this to mean um, extremely short and accented, staccatissimo, ta 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 ta. Okay, so this is useful if you, and believe me, um, flute players, oboe players, clarinetists, um, bassoonists, all of them are capable of a true staccatissimo. It's not necessarily true of all instruments. Um, let's say French horn, if you asked a, a French horn player to, to play staccatissimo, I think you would find their staccatissimo and, and the, um, the the cutoff of the instrument is not as dry and brittle as you can make it sound on a woodwind. Or let's say a tuba, same problem. Um, but woodwind players, they, they can play a true staccatissimo. This is a, a great tool in your in your on your belt that you can use as an arranger and composer. Okay, mixing indications. What is this? We have a, a well simple phrase. How am I supposed to interpret that we have a, a tie C to a C, but then the, the C has a, a staccato marking and there's a slur over it? I'm very confused. Now, some might say, well, that means, so we want a slight release at the end. Ta -ta -ta. Or does it mean that that is the length of an eighth note? Because remember, technically a staccato is half the value. So, oh, is that an eighth note? So does that just mean to hold? In which case, why not just write a shorter note value? Um, if you truly want them to tongue, don't, don't mark the, the tie. If you truly want them to tongue the downbeat of the second bar, 
ta ta don't mark the 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 tie okay so you can see how how confusing this would be different performers would perform that in in different ways okay so all of that was was um, in an effort to be as clear as possible uh, for the instruments you're writing for. So what is the sound you're picturing and how do you want it communicated on the page? Remember, it's a three part process. You, you imagine something, write it down, you put it in front of the performer, they interpret it, and it goes out to the audience who hears it. And that cycle, things can get lost along the way. It's like playing telephone did you ever play the game uh, telephone when you were young? You you whisper in someone's ear, um, hello, my, my name is Bob. And by the time it goes all the right way around, it says, I like bananas. And you're not sure how, well, how did it get to this completely other different, this other phrase? Or um, how was it misinterpreted? Well, messages can get interpreted poorly um, I'm always surprised that um, you, you think some things are very obvious are not obvious to everyone. So what you are imagining um, in your mind, uh, you want to put that on the page and be as explicit as you can be. Okay, let's continue. Double tonguing. Well, so far we've, we've talked about single tongues, as in every, every time we have a note, we have a new ta. For example, the phrase ta 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 Or let's say on a single note F as we have here. Ta 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 ta. Everyone try that with me. Ta 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 ta. 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 And of course, if we speed this up, we might have a problem. Ta 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 ta. 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 Okay, so far so good. I can keep up. What if I want truly fast? Okay, now I'm getting a little bit sloppy. It's hard for me to keep up in terms of single tonguing. So instead of saying ta for every syllable, a simple solution is to say taka. Can you try this with me? How fast can you do this? Why don't you take 30 seconds, pause the video, and do some practicing of double tonguing. Okay, and when you're ready, well, that's not all, because what about Triplets, let's say. Well, triplets wouldn't work so well if you were trying double tonguing. Tucka, 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 tucka. I suppose it's possible, but it doesn't make all that much sense, given that the emphasis might not be exactly fitting with um, triplet phrases. Okay, so how can we how can we alleviate that problem? Well, you have three different ways of of um, tonguing what's called triple tonguing. Um, so one way is takata, the other is kataka, and the last tataka. So why don't we try this first phrase with takata, very slowly. Takata, 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 you can tell I've practiced the first one more than the second. Perhaps you're, you you can be faster there. And let's try the the last tataka. All right, it's a workout for the mouth, but I assure you this is a, a much easier than saying ta 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 ta
much easier to roll off the tongue, literally. Why don't you take 30 seconds, pause the video, practice one of your choosing. I, I tend to gravitate towards takata. Um, I know plenty of other uh, people who, who use the others. So go ahead and practice one of those. All right. Um, so now, how do you use these? Well, you don't have to indicate them in the score. Just know that they are possible, especially when it comes to flute. The great thing about the flute, there's nothing in their mouths that that is pre preventing them from articulating. Taka 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 ta, or taka 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 ta ta. It's quite simple for them. Or I shouldn't say simple because it's a bit of an advanced technique, but it's simpler for them to perform double and triple tongue than any of the other woodwinds. And why is that? Well, of course, you're saying, Dr. Nabel, it's very obvious. They're, they have reeds that they have to put in their mouths. And of course, that would get in the way of their tongue. So try going taka 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 ta with something in your mouth. Taka 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 ta. It's not as easy. Um, so you can you should consider this a flute technique in general. Um, why is this important if you don't have to write it in the score? Well, this is a goes into a general category of knowing what is possible for each instrument before you compose for it. Um, it's very it, it's very practical to know. Okay, I can take at quarter note equals one twenty. Ta 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 who can, but would, by the way, some instrumentalists, um, some reed players are able to use double and triple tongue, um, but you shouldn't consider that um, uh, ubiquitous throughout um, the, the entire choir. Okay, so know, know what's possible before you write for it. It seems like an obvious thing to say. I've seen so many things on the page that just don't make sense for the instrument. So imagine the instrument and what's possible while you're writing it. What about flutter tongue? Of course, on, on the keyboard, I'm imitating it like, like this, going back and forth as fast as possible. Here, FLZ standing for flautzengando, meaning the same thing, to flutter. And you'll notice that's, in com that's accompanied with um, three slash marks. You'll almost always see three slashes and an indication. Um, um, uh, and most of the time that's flutter. Uh, but you can see FLZ as well. Um, OK, what is it and how is it made? Well, in general, um, and it depends on the performer. But in general, we're talking about um, rolling your R. <laughs> rolling the tongue towards the, the front. Um, I shouldn't say R, it's, it's more like it's rolling towards the, the front of your uh, palate. Now, some people are not able to do this at all. Um, and even on the flute, they'll growl instead. Um, no, why don't you take some time, practice both of those and you might see how difficult it is to, to perform. This is not um, a beginning technique, um, but let's say, uh, you know, an instrumentalist who's been playing towards um, for a few years and towards the end of their time in high school or beginning of college should be able to, to perform this. Um, what instruments are we talking about? Flutter, well, that goes in the same category as, well, double tongue and triple tongue, because of course you need the tongue to be active. Um, and so we're talking about the flute. It's a beautiful sound. I'll leave some, some links to, to um, famous pieces with um, flutter tongue. Um, it's a gorgeous sound. Of course, it takes a lot of air. And you probably don't want to overuse this. 
Uh, it's a very special technique, but think of it as a, a really fine spice. Uh, you use just the right amount of it if you're hearing um, that technique and uh, it can really uh, add a lot to your piece. Um, okay, what about the growl? <laughs> well, the growl can be performed by any of the woodwind instruments. In fact, any of the wind instruments. So we're talking now about all of the, the woodwind choir and all of the brass choir. <laughs> and this can actually be a, a, a great technique um, to use to give something some grit or, um, you know, you, you picture this sound as sometimes associated with, um, you know, 1920s jazz solos or um, perhaps some modern techniques which um, which want to sort of uh, rough around the edges uh, timbre. Um, this can be a, a, a um, an effective way to to bring a, a little bit of uh, something modern and something uh, a little bit spicier in the mix. And sometimes I like to use um, the metaphor of cooking because well, cooking takes time. Um, it takes time to prepare a good dish, and you know um, you you have the the basics that you're you're uh, making. You have your protein. You have your vegetables, you have your, your carbohydrates, but you also want the spice, right? Um, however, if you overdo it, if you put too much salt, too much pepper, too much uh, Cajun, um, oh, this is, this is all making me very hungry, but too much uh, Cajun, too many Cajun spices, well, perhaps that's overpowering your, uh, your dinner. Uh, well, I think of composition and, and arranging in, in similar ways in that spice is really helpful um, it makes makes your piece more interesting to add a uh, little bit of uh, flutter tongue here, perhaps growl here, perhaps uh, double tongue and triple tongue, different techniques. Um, but if if all you're eating is spice, it can it can overtake um, your piece. So um, be be careful how you use this. A little bit goes a long way. Okay, and finally, slap tongue. Um, and this technique is associated also with the flute quite, quite frequently. And that is literally um, pressing down the, the pads um, as they're playing, ta, 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 which gets a very percussive sound. Again, I'll, I'll send you a link to um, some pieces which employ this. And this can be, again, a really beautiful way to introduce percussive sounds. Um, be careful of overdoing it and, and only using flutter and only using slap tongue. However, I should say, if that's, if that's the sound you're, you're looking for, if that's, if that's your, the reason for this piece existing, then by all means, use those techniques. And lastly, this is pr a pretty rare category. But if, if you are looking for some real subtleties, it's possible instead of using ta, to think in terms of different vowels. Ta, tu, da, du. You can shape your mouth in different ways when it comes to the flute. Um, so again, this, is, this falls into a very specialized category. And these, these tend to be more um, modern techniques. And again, they can, they can be used um, effectively, especially when used sparingly. Okay, and this brings us to the last couple points. Um, so just like singers, vibrato can be quite natural. Um, it depends on the, the instrument. For, for example, flute is often asked to play vibrato. If you say nothing about vibrato, they will probably play with vibrato. If You might ask for straight tone, you might ask for for vibrato by marking a, a wavy line. If you want a truly uh, large amount of vibrato where you're actually changing a bit of the pitch, that is also possible, given uh, that the flute can, can bend down quite easily. Um, in terms of the other instruments, it's not as common for uh, clarinet, oboe, um, bassoon to have as much vibrato but of course the you know it is possible for them um to add it so if if that is what you're hearing you could you can say just as you would mark a vocal score vibrato non vibrato molto vibrato 
um, etc. Or you can say also straight tone. Okay, and lastly, this is a, a very a specialized um, technique and, and um, it's something that I think you would enjoy looking into as, if you're looking for advanced techniques. However, if, if you feel like, well, this is enough for, I've covered the basics, now I, I feel like I can, I can begin writing um, something for, let's say, flute. Once we, we uncover more about its range and dynamic contour, and we should look at some pieces that are effective for flute. Um, but if you'd like to go one step further, you should know that uh, the partials of the instrument um, can be, different partials of the instrument can be activated. So depending on um, the fingering, you might have the same note played with different fingering. And of course, that will affect the timbre. So you can see here, um, here we have the, the same fingering, but different notes are coming up. Um, Okay, again, this is this is specialized. And if, if you're looking um, for more techniques, I would refer you to uh, Robert Dick, who's a famous flautist who specializes in advanced flute techniques. Um, and we'll we'll listen um, to some of those uh, shortly. So again, I I hope um, you enjoyed this this um, overview of the woodwind choir we'll be getting specifically into the flute family soon. Um, before you start writing, before you start composing though, we need to know, well, what are the basics? What are the, what are the, um, what is the basic range of the instrument, the low to high? What is the common range? What range do they start learning first? Who is it you're writing for? Are you writing for a, a beginning player, an intermediate player, a professional? These are all the, the questions you should be asking yourself. And if there's one thing to take away um, from this, this, um, this talk today is that what you're imagining um, needs to be put on the page to be as explicit as possible. And that's what this, this class is all about, is learning, okay, what is possible on these various instruments and how do those instruments work well together? Okay, so uh, feel free to send me your questions um, by email, by Google Classroom, um, however, you can get a hold of me is great. And uh, I look forward to uh, listening to some music, to more discussion and to getting more, more in depth into um, the flute family coming up. All right, so I'll see you all shortly. Take care.